All right. Well, welcome everyone. We've got clinical grand rounds and optic neuropathies. You've got some nerve. Dr. Salka is going to be presenting for us tonight. And Dr. Salka is an optometric physician at Center for Sight in Sarasota and Venice, Florida. This is a large medical surgical practice where he focuses on glaucoma. And really, we're going to see tonight the, the highlights of his neuroophthalmic disease. He is also the residency educator for Center for Sight. He's also the director of optometric business development for USI. Joe, how many years were you at? Uh, how many years you like to say you're at Nova? 28 years and two days. Joe is at was a professor at opt of optometry at Nova Southeastern University College of Optometry for 28 years and two days. He's also a founding member of the Optometric Glaucoma Society and Optometric Retina Society. And he's also the founder and former chair of Neuroophthalmic Disorders in Optometric Specialty Interest Group for the American Academy of Optometry. He's also a diplomate in the American Academy of Optometry in Glaucoma. In 2021 and 2022, he ranked number four optometrist by Newsweek magazine. But my partner did not stop there. He was ranked number one in 2023 for Newsweek's ratings. He is a partner and co-founder of Optometric Education Consultants. Joe is a great friend. Joe, the podium and the virtual floor is all yours. I think I hear that round of applause. Well, thank you, Greg. And we can't uh, forget that Greg was also on that list of top doctors with, uh, in Newsweek, Newsweek in 2023. So congratulations to you too, Greg. Thank you, Joe. All right, Greg, I may have to call upon you to keep me grounded. This is going to be a, a pretty heavy topic. And, uh, you know, you need to prevent me from just making this one long sentence. And if I start getting into the weeds, you'll try to uh, redirect me. Uh, these are my disclosures. I've been consulting with Bausch and Loam and on their speakers bureau, but I have no financial interest in anything that we may talk about. I can trade. Uh, I created the content. Uh, I own optometric education consultants with Greg, and everything has been mitigated. So we're going to start off with a 28-year-old female who presents with intermittent blurred vision and visual gray outs. Uh, intermittent horizontal double vision and chronic headache worsening over the past two weeks. Now, she claims white coat hypertension and a shoulder injury six months ago for which she uses a, uh, a muscle relaxant. Uh, height and weight, she's five foot three, about 220 pounds. Visual acuity is normal 2020 in each eye. She has no, uh, she has no acuity loss. Pupils and motility in the office are normal. And we see this, and we can see bilaterally edematous optic nerve, some juxtapapillary hemorrhages, some obscuration of the major vessels. And we can see some folds in the retina called Patton's folds. And these are representative of advancing and regressing retinal edema uh, emanating from the optic nerve. So, Greg, it already brings me to polling question number one, if you don't mind launching that. Yeah, let me get that up here, and we'll get it launched. And an FYI, that's the Mendenhall Glacier in Alaska. Okay, the question is open. When? What is the next test for your patient's needs? MRI, MRB, CT scan, lumbar puncture. What is the next medical test that this patient needs? MRI, MRV, CT, lumbar puncture. So where is this, Joe? Remind me. This is the Mendenhall Glacier in Alaska. The responses are rolling in nicely. Alaska is a beautiful, beautiful place in our country to visit if you've never if you've never been.
All right. I think we have a nice amount. I think the trend is set. So let's mm -hmm. take a look here. I'll display it. I won't close it quite yet. We have 49, 50% it just hit that says MRI. No one picked MRV. CT scan was 19% and lumbar puncture is 32. So well, there are a lot of things here. I mean, sometimes CT is the test that is required insurance before they move on to uh, MRI. MRI is an important test here. A lot of people don't uh, think about MRV, but that's actually... Uh, an important test if we're thinking increased intracranial pressure. And lumbar puncture can be done only if we know there's no mass lesion. Well, she has a dull ringing in her ears, a pulsatile tinnitus. Her blood pressure is 142 over 100, certainly not in the range of malignant hypertension. Uh, everything else was pretty much unremarkable. She did have a blind spot enlargement and a nasal step, very mild, uh, in each eye and her visual field. Ultimately, her serology was normal. Imaging was done, MRI with small ventricles, otherwise normal. Lumbar puncture did get performed. Her opening pressure was 510, uh, about twice of what it should be. Uh, there is no abnormalities in her CSF, and she was diagnosed with pseudotumor cerebri. But more specifically, she really has papilledema. And the diagnosis of the cause of the papilledema is pseudotumor. Signs is typically a bilateral disc edema, like glaucoma. The inferior and superior aspect of the optic nerve is going to be affected first, with ultimately an obliteration of the cup. Early on, hemorrhages are pretty common. As it becomes chronic, hemorrhages are not common. And there's typically no spontaneous venous pulsation. I actually had to look at that, uh, uh, look for that on Friday, like every other time, never there when I need it. And we just talked about the patents folds. Now, the visual field defects can be highly variable. Usually we start with an enlarged blind spot that can progress onto arcuate defects, very glaucoma like and a very constricted field late in the disease. Now, because it's bilateral and symmetric, there typically is no afferent pupillary defect, and visual acuity early in the conditions are often normal. Symptoms, transient visual obscurations or graying out bilaterally of vision, only last seconds, but can happen many times during the day, particularly if they bend over to pick something up. And an intermittent horizontal diplopia from a unilateral or six-nerve paresis. Now, headache is very common. Nausea and vomiting can occur, dizziness can occur, and certainly a pulsatile tinnitus is uh, very common as well. Now, papilledema has several types. You can have acute, chronic, and atrophic. Acute, as we see in the lower left, there's hemorrhages, exudation, hyperemia, a lot of nerve fiber layer edema. And this is actually really very concerning to me because when we see that, we're looking at something that is really pretty new. We don't know that the patient has a pseudotumor. They can have other situations. So acute is really troubling to me. Chronic in the middle, you know, there's there's no uh, no hemorrhages. You can see the patents lines from the advancing and regressing edema. This is a, a, a situation telling you it's been there for a while. Sometimes collateral vessels may be present, but I find that actually pretty infrequent. And lower right, atrophic. Uh, papilledema is chronic long enough, they'll have atrophy. And if you notice, there really doesn't seem to be any elevation because well, frankly, dead things don't swell. So that is a that is how we see the acute, the chronic, and the atrophic papilledema. Now, the disc edema is from axoplasmic stasis. Now, papilledema is specifically edema of the optic nerve from elevated intracranial pressure. We can only suspect clinically papilledema. We can't diagnose it clinically until we know or strongly surmise that there's elevated intracranial pressure. Now, there's me, in, intracellular fluids, metabolic waste products, byproducts are going to get regurgitated. And papilledema, the cerebral edema, is being transmitted along the uh, op optic nerve subarachnoid space, giving this engorged, swollen optic nerve. 
Now, papilledema can occur from increased brain volume, as we see in the lower left, the large mass that is causing midline shift, increased intracranial blood volume, volume, such as a hemorrhage, as we see in the middle, and increased volume of CSF from hydrocephalus. Now, you don't have to have a huge mass lesion like you see in the lower left to cause this. If you, you can have a smaller lesion that, that may actually block uh, trans, tran, uh, transit of cerebral spinal fluid through the ventricular system, giving the hydrocephalic state. So you don't need a big mass there. Small mass in the right place can cause hydrocephalus. The number of patients that I image, you know, I have some small, at least some small degree of hydrocephalus. Now, acute papilledema, when suspected, I think is a, is a bit of an emergency because we re need some immediate neural imaging to rule out a mass. And if that imaging is normal, a lumbar puncture to measure the pressure and also to analyze the CSF to, to rule out meningitis or any other disease processes. Also, atrophic papilledema with significant vision or field loss is an urgency because the patient's going blind. We really need to intercede very quickly to get that taken care of. <laughs> papilledema with any other neurologic abnormality, such as a fever or stiff neck, we're probably looking at a meningitis. Now, chronic papilledema with very little vision loss is not such an emergency. And those are patients that can be worked up on an outpatient basis as long as you know that they don't have significant vision loss. Hmm. Now, here's an interesting thing. I want to differentiate for you pseudotumor cerebri versus IIH or in, uh, idiopathic intracranial hypertension. I think there are a lot of people in the you know, out there that believe IIH is the new term, the 2024 term, and pseudotumor is an old term. And that's not really the truth. That's not really correct. Pseudotumor means increased intracranial pressure, but there's no tumor. That's it. No tumor. But there are other agents that have been identified. There are certain medications that can cause it. Venous sinus thrombosis can cause it. Ergo, Pseudotumor can be primary or secondary. If we have medication usage or venous sinus thrombosis that's contributing to this, we call that a secondary pseudotumor. Now, IIH is increased intracranial pressure, but there's no identifiable cause, but there's no medicines. There's no venous sinus thrombosis. And these are the typical younger obese females who are at risk. They don't have to be obese. You know, they tend to be just above, you know, sometimes just above the uh, uh, a normal BMI. So primary pseudotumor is IIH. There's no cause. If there is something identifiable in association, we call it secondary pseudotumor. Or reality is pseudotumor is still the best uh, best term to use. And it results from poor CSF drainage at the arachnoid villi. Now, pseudotumor symptoms, headache in about 84% of patients, and that's due to increased intracranial pressure, and that can fluctuate with the patient's weight. Patients have gained weight, the headaches tend to get worse. They lose 10 pounds, 15 pounds, their headaches get better. Transit visual obscuration, about 68%. It is bilateral and very transient, several seconds only. And this is vascular congestion and blood flow cessation. Back, a radicular pain in about half because we have increased uh, CSF pressure in the dural sheath. Pulsatile tinnitus from cerebral venous sinus stenosis. And diplopia from a unilateral or bilateral six nerve palsy in about 18% of patients. Now, there are a number of medications that can do this, oral contraceptives. Uh, tetracycline, uh, doxycycline, minocycline drugs can do this, Accutane, uh, vitamin A retinoids, estrogen, growth hormone, lithium, probably some others that are, are too numerous to mention, but these are all thought to inhibit CSF uh, resorption at the arachnoid villa. Now, here's some issues, disc edema, clues and concerns. 
I'm going to tell you right now, OCT is only so-so at making this diagnosis. Uh, sometime you might ha you might be able to get a deflection of Brooks membrane opening. Here, it looks like it's deflecting downwards a little bit. That mitigates against disc edema and, and mitigates toward something more toward optic nerve drusen or just a congenital anomaly. If Brooks membrane opening deflects upwards, that is pretty well indicative of increased intracranial pressure. Increased nasal thickness over 88 microns is more associated with disc edema than disc drusen. But it has been pretty well shown that OCT is not reliable in, in differentiating optic disc drusen from early papilledema. So it's only so-so. And fields can be normal in about 19% of these patients, so that may not help. So the conclusion here is sometimes you just can't tell. And that's why we're going to do the visual fields, the photographs. We're going to do the OCT. Uh, you want to you want to look at the macula, the GCC, the nerve fiber layer, and you want to get the rosters through the optic nerve as well. So you're going to try to put, in the early cases, everything together in order to try to differentiate this from a masquerader versus true early disc edema. And even the experts can't tell sometimes. In fact, uh, we, had a, we had a conference. We had one of the top neuro-ophthalmologists in the country, Dr. Grant Liu. And he was talking about how when he finishes neuro-ophthalmology fellowship, he said, you know, I... I felt pretty good. I felt I, I could look at it. I, I can tell. And then he wanted to say, and after he'd been in practice for a while, he realized that anybody who said what he said just didn't look at enough optic nerves in their career yet. So even the best can't tell sometimes. But here's something that just, uh, just came out uh, last month, looking at artificial intelligent, intelligence to differentiate pediatric pseudopapilledema from true papilledema on photographs. And I have to delve into this a little bit more, but looking at, you know, they, they looked at fundus photographs of pediatric papilledema and pseudopapilledema. They found that this artificial intelligent model achieved over 90% sensitivity at detecting true papilledema and was better and there was better than neuro, than two neuro ophthalmology experts. So we might be looking at this sometime in our future to help uh, help make this uh, make this diagnosis for us. So make, diagnosing right now, signs and symptoms consist with increased intracranial pressure, papilledema, disc edema, and it may be subtle. And they have to have a normal neurologic examination. All they're allowed to have six nerve abnormalities because. When the intracranial pressure is elevated, the brainstem herniates down through frame and magnum. It stretches a sixth nerve across the clivus. Sixth nerve or an, or an acquired esoposture is pretty common. Neuroimaging has got to be normal, no evidence of hydrocephalus, no mass, no structural lesion. And MRV needs to be done looking for venous sinus thrombosis. And the CSS has to be normal. Now, lumbar puncture, adults are up to 250, children up about 280. This is probably incorrect. We're probably going to have to redefine this. Now, a study came out not that long ago that looked at, at increased, at, at, uh, that the opening pressures on people not suspected of having papilledema, and they found that normal ranged up to about 300 millimeters. So we probably have to redefine this. So the 250 to 300 sort of is going to be in that gray zone. Now, it is getting harder to do lumbar puncture, and it can be deferred in certain circumstances. The MRI and MRV have to show no abnormalities. And additionally, if they have some other features, it'll be very helpful. Flattening of the globe, we can we can see a distension here of the optic nerve a sheath, and the globes are flattened. That is pretty characteristic. Empty cella, empty cella tersica, the CSF, the the pituitary gland is very gelatinous. So as CSF 
is increasing, it basically squashes it down so that the cella tersica looks like there's nothing in there. Now, here's a caveat. An empty cella, partially empty cella, is, occurs even without increased intracranial pressure. So there's questionable use, usefulness if this was found in other situations. Paper just came out looking at patients who had been imaged for other optic neuropathies, and they assessed and they saw about 17% of patients who weren't suspected of having increased intracranial pressure had an empty cella. There has to be no evidence of a fever or acute infection. And if they're the typical profile, young, female, somewhat overweight, you know, we can probably make a clinical diagnosis without doing the lumbar puncture. Of course, if the patient responds properly and the headache begins to cease with weight reduction and they respond positively to diamox, and you know that that really helps, and we probably don't have to do uh, we probably don't have to do the lumbar puncture. Now managing these patients, so there's low vision loss, they're going to undergo symptomatic headache therapy. Uh, cetazolamide, 500 milligrams three times a day. Sometimes it can go up as much as a, as a gram three to four times a day, and it's a nasty drug. Weight reduction is important, and, and the side effects of, of, that, of high dose of cetazolamide is often a good impetus for patients to, uh, to lose weight. Mild vision loss, pretty much the same thing as cetazolamide, but there are, are other um, diuretics such as furosemide, topiramate, sinistamide that can be used. Topiramate is, is good in that it can actually help with weight reduction, and it does have some weak carbonic anhydrase inhibitor properties. And of course, weight reduction, and it's speculative. I think our agreement is about 10%. I've seen as low as six, seven, or five percent, but ten percent of your weight lost is really pretty crucial here. And they really need to keep the weight down. We don't really know. We don't really know what the relationship is and why this happens. We just we just don't know. Now, if there's no or mild vision loss, prognosis is really pretty good. Uh, if they lose weight and they can tolerate the diamox. And generally, everything should resolve in about six to nine months. But we, as ODs, need to follow up uh, with, uh, with OCT, photography, and visual fields. Here's a nice example. 33-year-old female, horizontal double vision. Hey, Joe. Hey, yeah. The patient that you were talking about earlier, um, yes. are you going to get back to that patient? Uh, no, I think I've left her behind. Okay, um, because she, she, we did yeah. we did have a question about someone asking, was there a visual field done mm -hmm. on that person? Uh, the very first patient, the answer is yes. yes. She had enlarged blind spot and small nasal steps. Now, this 33-year-old has headaches and transient visual obscuration, not blackouts, but grayouts, 20 times per day, couple seconds. No oral contraceptives, tetracycline, vitamin A, no exogenous medication. She had lost 10 pounds recently. She knows that her headaches had improved. Her blood pressure is normal. Her She's 5'5", 160, BMI 26. You know, not grossly obese by any means. And this is what she looks like. And we can see bilaterally swollen optic nerves. Uh, no evidence of acuteness. This actually looks very chronic. We can see the patterns lines. The, uh, the OCT is kind of off the scale because of the juxtapapillary edema. And we can see that uh, there's an enlarged blind spot with a little bit of a superior uh, defect. So this is a person who really is not in imminent danger of losing vision. Now, patient was ultimately evaluated with lumbar puncture. Uh, was diagnosed with pseudotumor. The, everything, there's no venous sinus thrombosis. There is no mass lesions. And she was put on Diamox and instructed to lose some weight. And what we did here in photographs, and this is where it's crucial to be involved. We can see over a period of about three months that there has been a reduction in the disc edema. Now, if I were to look at this clinically, I say there's disc edema. If I look at this clinically, I say there's disc edema. I don't know without the photographs 
has there been a change? Photographs, OCT, critically important to do. Visual field, right? Maybe this was some artifact, but it certainly got better as her uh, inter increased intracranial pressure came down. Now, just imagine if I turn the arrows the other way and she went from here to here and from here to here. Now we have evidence to tell the co-managing physicians the therapy is insufficient and the patient is actually getting worse. So managing these patients, severe or progressive vision loss or if they're refractive to medical therapy. Optic nerve sheath decompression can be done. They actually just cut up the part of the sheath so that the CSF can drain out. And we don't have such a compartment, compartment syndrome going on there. But that's kind of like unbuckling your pants after a big meal. High dose IV steroids and IV acetazolamide and a lumboperitoneal shunt or a CSF diversion uh, surgery uh, to drain it to another body body cavity. Now, venous sinus stenting uh, is, is out there. It is putting a stent in the, transfer, the venous sinus at the junction of the transverse and sigmoid sinus. Uh, the procedure is controversial, and it is technically very difficult. Now, an intrinsic uh, venous sinus thr uh, thrombosis, okay? Intrinsic, that's what's causing the pseudotumor, all right? That does not reverse with normalization of the, inter uh, of the intracranial pressure. That is still, that, that thrombosis is still going to be there. Now, if the thrombosis is due to the increased intracranial pressure, Lowering it will will alleviate that thrombo that thrombosis and open up the uh, the sinuses. Now here's There's another a question. Patient. If you want it now, Joe. Yeah, sure. It says, "Why would it not be necessary to know the spinal fluid pressure at onset on outset?" Oh, it 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 is it is beneficial to make the diagnosis. Getting harder to get it done. A lot of times they don't get the uh, they they it, it's done and they don't get the opening. I'm just saying that you may come across instances where it is obviated if certain criteria are met and it looks pretty straightforward. Now, if anything changes, they will undergo lumbar puncture. Certainly, it's not going to happen if they're being managed outpatient. If they're being managed inpatient, uh, lumbar puncture is probably it's probably going to be done. Now, this is a patient that I've been dealing with for the past uh, probably three weeks. 32-year-old female, chronic headaches for two to three months, has gained weight in the past several months, and has admitted she's gained 40 to 50 pounds in the last two years overall. She's referred to me referred into me for suspected disc edema. Now, she denies oral contraceptives, tetracyclines, vitamin A, no... She's only using an iron tablet and a vitamin B9, and not at high doses. She's had bilateral transient visual obscuration the past one to two months, lasting several seconds to up to a minute, but just about two to three times per day. She's 2015 in each eye. There's no afferent defect. Um, we put her through the ringer. At the end, at the end of everything, I ran a visual field, but you know, they didn't look very good because she was tired. She was dilated. She was anxious. She, she didn't feel she really understood the test. And this is what she looks like. And we can see that there's bilateral disc edema. It does not appear to be acute in any, in any fashion. Her OCT, again, is all complex, looks normal. The, uh, the nerve fiber layer is fairly well uh, elevated and maybe a little bit off the chart, but there is certainly an inter-eye asymmetry, which could be due to differing degrees of disc edema. So chronic in appearance, there's no hemorrhage or exudation, possibly been developing for a while. You know, she's you know been a couple months with symptoms. OCT shows no discernible gain in cell loss. Nerve fiber assessment is kind of dodgy due to the edema. So at this point, approaching as outpatient, uh, I talked with her PCP, 
And uh, these are the tests I ordered. MRI and everything I ordered urgently. MRI, brain in orbit, with and without contrast, rule out mass leaves and hydrocephalus, empty salad, flattened globes. And yes, I put this down here. Also, MRV, please rule out venous sinus thrombosis. So this is this is what my script looked like that I gave to her to take, you know, to take to the uh, imaging center. We assisted with her getting imaging. She's insured. She had a significant deductible. She wants to find an imaging center for that will accept payment, a payment plan. She gets two appointments, cancels them for financial reasons. Her PCP tries to help, recommends a health center for the underinsured, but says she has to apply, needs to get improved, needs to go through foundations, yada, yada, yada. So I had already scheduled her for two-week follow-up. Disc acuity was unchanged. I'll repeat the fields. Fields came out really pretty well as they did the first day when she felt uh, when she was dilated. So this is actually probably real loss. And at this point, I said, look, we're done. You can't play, you know, neuroradiology. Let's make a deal. Take everything that I've given you, including my notes, go to your your favorite emergency room, uh, show it all to them and let them handle it. You know, at this point, and this is why we need to do fields. Probably the most important test that you can do is visual field. IIH is a slowly progressive condition until it's not. There is a subset called Fulman and IIH, and she probably falls somewhere in the spectrum. It's the same diagnostic criteria for IIH or pseudotumor, but it's a short duration between symptoms and loss of vision. It can get worse over several days, and these are patients typically that need shunts or CSF diversion surgeries or optic nerve fenestration. Now, this is a a text consult that came in to me, a 24-year-old female. I know nothing about her her BMI. She's 2020 and complains vision gets cloudy and going from dark to light. So the the OD who texted me had some questions about does she need an MRI? Does she need MR MRV? I think she's already thinking pseudotumor. You know, she said, you know, is this something we can do on an outpatient? Now, we take a look. And I don't like these type of images. They don't really show me things very well. But that right nerve looks very, very acute and hemorrhagic. And I, like, I don't like the looks of that. She shows me a field. We got some significant vision loss. I don't know that this is IIH or PTC. It could be a brain tumor. I just told her, look, it's not. this is not an outpatient case. You need to send your information along with the patient to the ER and get her worked up quickly. Now, that's a lot of stuff. Greg, does anything come in? You are caught up. Well, I'm going to give you something, a little little thing to uh, re help me remember what I just said. It's what I call my ode to a swollen disc. When you think the disc is swollen, the vessels north and south will appear stolen. Not all elevated nerves are edematous, just like not all snakes are venomous. Your thoughts should go to papilledema, but infection and inflammation should still be in your schema. MRI, MRV, and LP are all soon to be. Remember, pseudotumor is a diagnosis of exclusion. Female firm does not make it a foregone conclusion. Brain tumors can exist when the pseudotumor profile is classic. So do the evaluation so they don't end up in a casket. If you can remember that, that's all you need. All right, which is better, one or two? Better one, better two. Can I see it again? Here are two patients with ostensibly the same diagnosis. One is the distinguished older gentleman, and the other is the distinguished middle-aged gentleman. And I want to tell you right now that nothing on this slide should imply that either George Clooney or Christopher Plummer were ever my patients. I'm not saying it. But I'm not, not saying that either. 48-year-old male has a painless loss of visual field in the left eye. He noticed that when he wakes up, he is still 20-20. Medical history is unremarkable except for a viral illness three weeks antecedent. And not COVID. And we can see he's got a nice inferior arcuate defect, which is noticeable to him. The other eye is perfectly clear. 
And we look and we see a hemorrhagic, hyperemic, swollen optic nerve. In the other eye, this is glial tissue, a small, crowded nerve with virtually no cup. So he's got a non-arteritic anterior ischemic optic neuropathy in the left eye and a disc at risk in the right. Compare and contrast that to the 74-year-old male who presents to a VAER with the worst headache of his life. He, over a three-week period, he sees a physician assistant, a emergency department physician, a cardiologist, and a nurse practitioner, as well as, well as three optometrists. He first goes in, he sees a PA, says he's got the worst headache of his life, she diagnoses te temporal mandibular joint dysfunction. The ED, ED physician, I don't know if he examined or not, just signed, but did sign off. Patient was given some NSAIDs. Now, histories include eye ache, jaw pain, scalp pain, facial pain, somnolence, malaise, and jaw claudication. Somnolence to the point he'd fall asleep while eating his food. So he comes back several weeks later, and they find a tick on him, and he's in a Lyme endemic area, so he's diagnosed now with Lyme disease. And in the records, it actually had been written vasculitis, such as temporal artery is highly unlikely, not GCA, but somebody did order a sed rate C reactive protein, which were elevated, but there's no indication they're, the, they're ever acted upon or reviewed. Ultimately, an optometrist makes the diagnosis, obtains steroids to give to the patient, but it was a poor outcome. Greg, I think that brings me to polling question number two. All righty, let's get that launched here. All right, open the question. It is now open. All right. A 70-year-old patient with headache presents with pale, swollen disc. What is the best referral? Neuro-ophthalmologist, hospital ER, internist, or retinal specialist? The question is open. If you're having trouble finding it on your uh, right side, second one down, polls. Hey, Greg, I think this is a gimme for you. Where are we now? Oh, I know this one. This is uh, Quebec City, and that's the Hotel Frontenac. Yes, exactly correct. One of the most impressive edifices I've ever seen. It is impressive. And I think we actually stood right about there and took a picture of the the whole group that we were with. Indeed, we did. And we'll be back there in August. All right, let's see here. It looks like people are rolling in nicely here. Again, a 70-year-old patient with headache presents with a pale, swollen disc. What is the best referral? All right, I'm going to display. I'll keep it open. I'll then display the results. So we have the winner being hospital ER at 65%. We have a neuro-ophthalmologist at 27%. Intern is 6 Retinal specialist, one, uh, 2%. Very good. I would agree. I certainly agree with the emergency department, as long as you're willing to help them. And we'll talk more about that in just a wee bit. But we're dealing with anterior ischemic optic neuropathy, hypoperfusion to the posterior ciliary circulation, feeding the anterior and lamer optic nerve. It can be arteritic or non-arteritic. Uh, in the non-arteritic form, arterial sclerotic disease uh, is largely the culprit, whereas in the arteritic form, an autoimmune vasculitis uh, is the cause. It's a unilateral presentation, but a high incidence of subsequent contralateral involvement, especially if it's arteritic. Now, arteritic anterior ischemic optic neuropathy will be bi progress to bilaterality in 65% of patients out an average of 10 days. Now, non-arteritic anterior ischemic optic neuropathy progresses to bilaterality at an average of 36 months. And after five years, only 15% of non-arteritic ischemic neuropathies are bilateral. So if you think you're dealing with a bilateral ischemic neuropathy, Unless there is severe blood loss and hypovolemia, 
you should not consider non-arteritic to be the cause. It should be always considered to be arteritic. Now, we can try to characterize the optic nerve, and non-arteritic, it tends to be a swollen hyperemic nerve, and typically the superior half is involved, where we have this dilatory teal injectasia trying to reperfuse that optic nerve. Whereas an arteritic, it tends to be a pale, swollen optic nerve with often not mu much else going on. Now, for non-arteritic risk factors, high blood pressure, diabetes, arterial, arterial and atherosclerotic disease, uh, small optic nerves, uh, smoking, and six to one, it will be an inferior field defect, not an altitudinal defect, but an inferior arterial defect. Six to one is going to be inferior. And anatomically, we do not know why. The nerve will be hyperemic and swollen, and there will be a disc at risk in that and the fellow eye. I mean, you're looking at probably a 0.2 or less CD ratio. If the CD ratio is a three or above, or they have superior visual field defects, this becomes a major diagnosis of exclusion for me. I don't feel comfortable just calling that non-arteritic. I'm going to do a very thorough workup on a, that type of patient. Progressive moderate vision loss with some potential recovery. The earliest I've ever encountered this was in, it was 37-year-old, uh, early 40s, and that's pretty young, but it can go all the way up to, to death. And it is painless, very important, painless. Arteritic is a pale swollen nerve. Uh, you can have nerve fiber layer infarcts. In fact, uh, within the last two weeks, I had a patient with temporal arteritis and uh, the optic nerves and vision were fine. Uh, however, the there, there was a, uh, a distinct isolated cotton wool spot, so nerve fiber layer infarcts. Pain of some sort, jaw pain, neck pain, head pain, shoulder pain, with severe optic nerve dysfunction. Many of these patients may come in no light perception. The visual field defects, if they can be assessed, tend to be inferior arcuate as well. Now, giant cell arteritis or polymyalgia rheumatica are risk factors. Now, the older the population that you have, the more likely you're going to come across this. In my practice, I have more patients over the age of 90 than under the age of 23. Average age is 70, but anybody over the age of 50 can have this disease. In fact, right now, in, if you go on PubMed and search any of the peer review literature, that talks about temporal arteritis, giant cell arteritis, or arteritic ischemic neuropathy, I can guarantee you the first sentence in the first paragraph of the introduction will say something to the effect of an autoimmune vascular afflicting patients over the age of 50. So 50 is the magic number. So Greg, I hate to say it for us, this is on our menu. I talked about the high risk of bilateral involvement. I do a lot of medical malpractice work. I've had four cases of temporal arteritis. And one active case I have right now uh, is allegedly missing temporal arteritis. And unfortunately, we tend to make this diagnosis when the second eye becomes blind. So we need a diagnosis. Careful history. And you have to ask about non-visual symptoms. Headache in over 90% of patients, scalp tenderness, jaw claudication. But don't ask, does it hurt when you chew? That's not really how they describe They They can have jaw claudication, but if you ask that way, they may not tell you what, what is really happening. It's their jaw gets tired. It's as if they're eating a tough steak or beef jerky. Ear pain, arthralgias, temporal pain, malaise, intermittent fevers. Of course, we're going to do our examination. And if we're suspicious, we're going to do some lab work. Sed rate, which can be lowered by statins and NSAID, but it's a quick test. C-reactive proteins, not going to be as effective and may not come back quick, as quick as, as, the, uh, as the sed rate. And an elevated platelet count. 
In fact, an elevated platelet count is more more helpful at ruling in giant cell arteritis than an elevated SED rate. And a normal platelet count is more helpful at ruling out giant cell arteritis than a normal SED rate. Now, if you're ever wondering what to do, I suggest read the chief complaint aloud uh, or read it to yourself. If you can say, I have a 72-year-old patient who is here for a comprehensive eye exam. Uh, she notes some dry eye and some difficulty with glare at night. She also mentions headache. Bing, bing, bing. Right there. If this were temple arthritis and the patient were to wake up blind, and that is in your chart, doesn't look good. You have to assess it. It's easy to do. I do it all the time. I, I order I order the serology a couple times a week. I rather have, you know, 19 out of 20 come back normal than 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 four out of five come back as positive because I'm not doing enough. Real easy test. I write it out. Uh, I just print it up on a uh, on a, an electronic script. Give it to him. Send the lab for request. Doesn't have to be fasting. Just walk in, get it done. Real easy to do. Initial symptoms in GCA, headache, we talked about that. Polymyalgia rheumatica, these are autoimmune disease, which in my opinion, PMR is just the different end of the spectrum of giant cell. They've got the disease. They just happen to be being managed by a rheumatologist, probably with low, low dose steroids. Now, you just can't ask a patient, hey, do, do you have any aches and pains? I did that one time. The guys can say, I'm 88, doc. Of course, everything hurts. But you can think of chair, hair, stare, and fair chair. It's hard for them to get out of the recliner. Hair hurts when they comb their hair. Stare, it's hard for them to walk upstairs. And fair, you know, we used to think this were, was a disease of Caucasians. And the reason we thought about it being a Caucasian disease is because a large population study looked at it and found the majority of patients with temporal arteritis were Caucasian. Now, the caveat is that was done in Olmsted County, Minnesota. Most patients were Caucasian. When it's done in Baltimore, Maryland, it's about 30% people of color. Uh, within the last six months, I, I have seen my first patient of color with biopsy proven temporal arteritis. Fevers, visual symptoms without vision loss, transient ischemic attacks or intermittent double vision, weakness, malaise, fatigue. You know, what do these all have in common? They can have a normal exam. That's why we have to think about the systemic symptoms. If you have an older patient that mentions scalp tenderness, headache, uh, and you choose not to e get the patient or evaluate the patient, you know, that's at your, at, that's at your own risk. Headache, if we look at the vascular distribution, the facial artery, the lingual artery, the thalamic artery, temporal artery, occipital artery, you can see the head pain can be anywhere. I've had patients complain of pain on the, uh, on the top of their head. So it can really be anywhere, temporal, occipital, neck, ear, jaw, scalp. You know, it can be anywhere. Pain is pain. Vision loss and ocular findings in GSA, uh, anterior ischemic optic neuropathy, or posterior ischemic optic neuropathy, where the optic nerve looks uh, perfectly normal. That is virtually always temporal arthritis. About 5% of central retinal artery occlusions are not thrombotic, but they are, they are vasculitis. The reason it's so small is the central retinal artery is generally a little too small to be involved by this disease. Transient ischemic attacks and intermittent double vision. Uh, I, I, have, I have had uh, those patients uh, relatively recently. You know, transient, vision, transient diplopia or... Intermittent six nerve palsy turns out to be giant cell. So making the diagnosis, we look at the prodromic symptoms. Uh, SED rate and C-reactive protein together gives a very high specificity. And elevated platelet count, I always put that in there. 
We also have to look at the examination. Unexplained cotton wool spots can also be a manifestation of giant cell arteritis. Now, a lot of these patients will, under, will often undergo artery biopsy, and you have to look at the report. To, you know, you read the report. Negative biopsy, no giant cells, no active arteritis. Well, to be honest with you, only half of these patients will have giant cells. But if it says focal interruption of the interelastic lamina, that's a healed arteritis, and they've got the disease. Temple artery ultrasound kind of is the way we're going. In fact, in Europe, they only do ultrasounds. They don't do biopsies any longer. Uh, I order ultrasounds very frequently in Sarasota. There's a vascular surgeon. His office is very responsive. I can get, a, I, I can get an ultrasound same day or next day uh, very easily. Now, the issue is this is a clinical diagnosis. You know, the positive biopsy or positive ultrasound, and the ultrasound is pretty close to uh, as good as temporal artery biopsy. The uh, it is a clinical diagnosis, though. So if you have positive ultrasound or biopsy results, it's pretty definitive. But if you don't have it, it doesn't mean they don't have the disease, and now you still have to make a clinical decision. If there's vision loss, they need steroids. If they're going to need hydration. They they have to watch their diabetes. They're going to need to have uh, they're going to need to have some some sleep aids because they'll become they'll develop insomnia from high dose steroids. And if there's vision loss, it's best done through the emergency room. And I have this here, and this is very important: two fifty milligram solumedrol four times a day for three days, followed by oral steroids 60 to 80 uh, until we can get them to a, a rheumatologist. And the reason I do this is when I said, you send them to ER, but be willing to help. Whenever I deal with this, I can virtually guarantee within a couple hours of sending them, I'll get a call from the ER physician. They will tell me what the results are. And the next question is, what do we do next? Their very, ER physicians are well trained, but they don't have the experience or confidence in the eye. So I can I will tell them what the dosing is and what should be done, and they'll thank me for my time. And you know, sometimes a couple hours later, I'll get a call from the hospitalist who's going to admit the patient, and they'll ask me the same thing: What do we do? Do we do a biopsy? How much steroids? How long do they stay on steroids? And interestingly. I'm working, I'm working, I've got a patient with temporal arteritis right now, and there's a neurologist involved, a PCP, and a rheumatologist, and uh, I think uh, I think Tuesday of last week, I, I walked in, and there was a message, like an urgent message from the rheumatologist, you know, please call me on my cell phone, and uh, we had a conversation, okay, what, what do we do? You know, she asked me, what, what do we do? I said, uh, well, this patient has temporal arteritis. The, the ultrasound was normal, but the sed rate, CRP, and platelets are all elevated. She has all the symptoms. All right, we got, I said, we got to do it. She says, is 40 milligrams good enough? I said, no, I prefer 60 to 80 milligrams. And we talked about Actemra, which is an IL-6 uh, inhibitor. It's a monoclonal antibody. And it is used as a steroid sparing agent to reduce the amount of steroids. And that is given... Uh, injection once a week, but it's very expensive and it's very hard to uh, to uh, get approval for that. So remember the EEs and GCA. They're E elderly. The ESR is E elevated. They only see the big E on the EI chart, and it is an E emergency. Non-arteritic ischemic neuropathy is diagnosed in the negative. It's diagnosed by not not what it is, but what it isn't. So how do you diagnose it? You got to prove it. If it's not arteritic, get the test. Every ischemic neuropathy, I'm going to get send rate, CRP, and platelets guaranteed unless it's medically impossible. And I probably will still get it. 66-year-old female, new sudden onset vision loss. She's 2,400 already from a long-standing map to the scar. That's unchanged, but she noticed change in her visual field for a day. She has a new onset inferior arcuate scotoma. Now, you take a look at it. She's got disc edema. 
mild pallor, no hemorrhages, no TL injectasia, left eye is a small crowded disc at risk, less than a 0.2 CD ratio. She's got mild headache relieved by over-the-counter analgesics, a little malaise, a little loss of appetite. She's lost seven pounds over four weeks. No jaw claudication, no temporal head pain. This is not a sickly woman. She is sitting there in the chair. She's, she's what I call it, a typical Sarasota suburbanite. She's sitting in the chair in her tennis outfit. The question is, what do you do? All right. You may be tempted to default to that diagnosis of convenience of non-arteritic, but this is not the right approach. Her SED rate was 96. Within three hours, we had her in a hospital bed, getting steroids into her arm, maintaining her good vision in her, in her good eye. And that's how we have to make these diagnoses. So which is better, one or two? He went bilaterally blind from not being diagnosed over three weeks. This patient had residual feel, but otherwise his, his, his life was not that impeded. So here's a very important pearl. Any acute vision loss in the elderly is GCA until proven otherwise. Say it to yourself. Say it after me. And Greg, what is our definition of elderly? 50 and older. 50 and above. Don't hate the don't hate the player, hate the game. So there's a lot of stuff there. Now, Greg, have any questions come in? No questions have come in. Things have been quiet. Okay. So either everybody's picking up what I'm putting down, or I'm hamming them into oblivion, which I don't want to do. So I'm going to make it a little bit easier with my O to an ischemic nerve. When your patient's optic nerve is ischemic, you better hope the disc is hyperemic. In non-arteritic, no treatment is needed, and life will rarely be impeded. But the disc is swollen and pale, and the vision is an epic fail. If the patient is 60s, 70s, or 80s, you'll feel heat like you're in Hades. ESR and CRP are required. The steroids must be acquired. Remember, whenever you see a choked disc, Always assess the giant cell risk. And if you can remember that, that's all you're going to need to know. Now, I will say, if you're ever wondering what to do, read the chief, read, read the history to yourself, either, either out loud or, or silently to yourself. Patient, 72-year-old uh, female, presents for a routine eye examination. Note some tearing and itching for which he uses cold compresses. Mentions headache. There it is. Okay. If if you if you say that out loud and you do nothing, it doesn't look good. Okay. I, I had that same situation. Uh, patient, she was uh, I think in her uh, I'm trying to think pro probably in her 80s. Routine examination. No, you know, really no complaints. But she mentioned some scalp pain. You know, it would happen in the morning, not every day, it would dissipate as the day goes on. It happened when she saw me that morning, it was already gone. All right. It really wasn't a, a, a big complaint, but I re I think to myself, 80-something-year-old female complains of scalp pain. You got to do something? I actually wrote, doubt zoster, doubt GCA, but we'll order serology. Her SED rate came back in the 60s, and her CRP was double. Uh, we got her into her internist and put her on some oral steroids. So it's very easy to miss. Just think, you know, what what do they mention? Hey, Joe, a question did roll in while you were doing sure. your ode. Is it possible mm -hmm. to have a patient with glaucoma that also has GCA or an anterior ischemic optic neuropathy? The answer is yes. GCA and arteritic ischemic neuropathy. The answer is yes. You know, comorbidities in an elderly population. What they're not allowed to have with glaucoma is a non-arteritic. And the reason is glaucoma is a disease of cupping. Non-arteritic is a disease of non-cupping. So they can't, those two don't go together. Great question. 29-year-old FEMA referred me for a glaucoma evaluation due to suspicious cupping, no complaints. Pressure 12 and 13. I used to get these all the time when I was teaching glaucoma service at, at NOVA. 29 years old, 12 and 13 pressure. I know this is going nowhere. 
So I always, would always say, Can show me a no, normal OCT so we can go home. They do an OCT. The right eye comes out normal. Left eye doesn't come out normal. The nerve fiber layer and the GCC are both abnormal. All right. I know she doesn't have glaucoma, and sometimes the OCT does let me down. So what I would usually do is bring him back for field, but she's 29 years old. Yeah, let's let's run a field. So they run a field, and the right eye comes out normal, and, and there is a defect in the right eye, in the left eye. I know she doesn't have glaucoma. This is probably artifact. Repeat the visual field. We want to go home. We repeat it, and it's still there. Now I've got a structural, a structural functional concordance. It all matches. All right. Now this is not going to be e an easy day, and I got to put my clinic jacket back on and get serious about it. She's 2015 in each eye, pressures of 12 and thir uh, 13, thin corneas, gonial normal, but she had a market after a defect in the left eye, probably a grade three, grade three, uh, grade three. Greg, do you, do you grade do you grade uh, APDs? Uh, yeah, I do. Pretty subjective, though. Yeah, really, it is. any anybody out there, it, it's there or it's not there. You know, when I was teaching university, I would I would grade I would grade it, but de defined by who saw it. A grade one APD would be picked up by a fourth year student. Grade two APD would be picked up by a third year student. Grade three APD would be picked up by a second year student. And a grade four would be picked up by a first-year student with a candle in a well-lit room. Mm -hmm. That's how I do. Hey, before you move on, Joe. Yeah. There is a question, I think, before we mm -hmm. get too far away from the GCA, is that how okay. do you distinguish a headache, normal headache, and a GCA headache? You can't qualify it. Pain is pain. You know, I... I I will in the elderly. I if they have headache, I'm always going to test for the disease. Even I don't think that it's going to come back positive because once or twice I'm going to get fooled, and it will come back positive. But we we can't we can't characterize the pain. Pain is pain. Good question though. So we take a look at this patient, and and she has segmental disc pallor from 12 to about 3:30. And that matches the visual field deficit, that matches the OCT deficit, and she has optic atrophy. And this is an exhaustive type of condition. Primary optic atrophy, we have uniform nerve fiber degeneration, glial replacement, but the optic nerve looks pretty well normal. The optic nerve can be pale or chalky white, but the margins are pretty distinct. The vessels are normal. You're going to see this in, in trauma and compression, such as tumor cases. Now, she truly has optic atrophy. There's a difference between optic atrophy and pallor. In order to have optic atrophy, there's going to be defects. You have a field defect, a nerve fiber layer defect, a pupil defect, a vision defect, a color defect. In the absence of that, you might just be looking at disc pallor, which can be congenital or an optic aberration, such as after cataract surgery. But when you have structural or functional loss along with pallor, now we're dealing with true optic atrophy. Secondary optic atrophy is from pathologic chronic disc edema, malignant hypertension, papilledema, uh, infiltrative diseases such as sarcoid or, or blood dyscrasias. Consecutive optic atrophy, you have degenerative retinal conditions, retinitis pigmentosa, pathological my uh, myopia, distinct central retinal artery occlusion. These are patients that have pale and waxy uh, disc, normal margins, and sometimes the, ar the arterial is going to be very attenuated. And temporal disc pallor, if it's bilateral, is often toxic or nutritional. Uh, if it is unilateral, it is often demyelinating, such as an old optic neuritis. 
Many potential etiologies, infarction, infection, infiltration, inflammation, trauma, toxicity, uh, metabolic uh, disease, compression of the nerve or chiasm. Yeah, what about um, em- radiation? Where would radiation fall in there? I have a couple of patients that you know, had some treatment on their head with for with radiation and ended up with, you know, an optic neuropathy, optic atrophy. I think that fall broadly in the category of trauma. It's sort of like radiation trauma. Okay. Now, traumatic optic neuropathy is pretty distinct. These are people that get hit like this, forehead hit. It will cause it will it will cause shock waves going through the you know going through the skull, and in the optic canal it can rupture. That's a very very tight area, and you can end up with with uh, traumatic neuropathies. But that's usually the person has gone over the handlebars and landed on their forehead. Something really significant. You know, getting hit in the eye is often not going to do that. MRI orbits, optic chiasm, brain with and without contrast, fat suppression is all necessary. Contrast gadolinium is going to be necessary to identify malignant lesions, demyelinating plaques, uh, indicative of multiple sclerosis. But anything that you say optic atrophy must be investigated or explained. You have you show me a dense macular scar and temporal pallor in the same eye, I'm satisfied. You show me PRP and a pale nerve, I'm satisfied. I know they had they have had an artery occlusion. I don't suspect it. I don't speculate it. I know they've had it. And a pale nerve, I'm satisfied. Systemic causes, sarcoidosis, tuberculosis, bachettes, lymphoma, leukemia, lupus, nutritional disorders, infectious, syphilis and Lyme, uh, infl- uh, autoimmune disorders. So at the very least, uh, CBC said ACE, ANA, cardiolipin, homocysteine, B12 folate, RPR, chest X-ray. This is going to be a long, this is going to be a long and drawn out type of situation. It usually isn't acute. I will usually start with imaging and then and then move on from there to the blood, the blood testing. Now this 29 year old, her MRI, the orbit was normal. We got a a brain MRI. There were no lesions. Lupus panel, ANA, double-stranded DNA, SED rate, metabolic panel, B12 folate uh, through her primary care, tested RPR and HIV, all negative, found nothing. Repeat three months, repeat visual field six months. She looks like this uh, on repeat testing. Uh, Nothing is changing. So at this point, dismissed her. If you, you know, come back for routine examinations, if anything, uh, anything changes, let us know immediately. Caveat, don't be a philosopher searching for truth. You're going to be disappointed. Sometimes we don't come up with an answer. Anything happening, Greg? Everything is quiet. Let me just make, sure I, scroll to, let me just make sure I scroll to the bottom. Okay. Yep, the last question was the headache question, so we're good. Okay. 54-year-old male referred me for glaucoma management. Told him he had glaucoma six years earlier, is in another country. Underwent no treatment. I don't know why. He's 20, 30, and hand motion right and left eye, respectively. Pressure is 30 and 23. And we take a look, and here his nerves are fairly large. Uh, cupping is rather robust. But it is not end-stage cupping by any means. He's got distinct rim pallor, left eye compared to right. Cupping does not match his vision. That brings me to polling question number three, Greg. Fantastic. I have the chat up. Let me get polling question three open here. Let me get that open up. And if you don't know where this is, Greg, this is the Tyne Church in Prague. Oh. After the Chateau of Frontenac, this is probably the second most impressive edifice I've ever seen. Okay. Your question is open. What does this patient most need? An immediate referral to the hospital ER. Immediate referral to a neurologist, neuro, neuro-ophthalmologist. Emergent, non-emergent MRI of orbits and chiasm. 
Uh, it's just glaucoma. What does this patient most need? Immediate referral to a hospital ER. Immediate referral to a neuro ophthalmologist. Non-urgent MRI of orbits in chiasm. Nothing, as this is just glaucoma. And polls are rolling in nicely here. Excellent. People are still with us. That's good. All right, I'll display some of the results before closing it here. We have 20% immediate referral to a hospital ER, 17% immediate referral to a neuro ophthalmologist, 64% non-urgent MRI of orbits and chiasm, and no one is calling it glaucoma. Very good, because the title of this lecture would be glaucoma somehow so that's correct and these were his visual fields and you can see he has a dense bitemporal defect with what would be considered junction scotoma there's a large pituitary adenoma that was so large it was compressing the posterior aspect of the left, or left orbit hence the disc pallor and the severe vision loss so we still need to do fields the age of rnfl imaging sometimes is not glaucoma because i will tell you his OCT was normal in the right eye and only moderately abnormal in the left. Another glaucoma patient, 56-year-old female, diagnosed with glaucoma five years earlier, complains of slowly progressive vision loss in the right eye. Light perception, 20-30, right and left eye respectively, had been using a combination medicine but not in the last several months. Her pressure is 19 and 18 with average pachymetry, and we can see very thin rim tissue, but I think what we can also appreciate is pretty significant disc pallor. Right eye could not do a visual field. Left eye certainly could, and she had a large uh, pituitary macroadenoma. Joe, so a question rolled had, in and yeah. said, where would ERG evaluation be appropriate? Uh, ERG can be done uh, anytime you suspect an optic neuropathy, and it is an ob uh, objective test. Uh, can help can help you identify if there is indeed something wrong with the optic nerve, but may not be classically diagnostic. Now, these patients have compressive neuropathies: so compression of the optic nerve, the orbit, a orbital apex, chiasm, can be a space occupying lesion, can be a t uh, tumor mass. Could be infiltrated extraocular muscles and Graves disease. And that's the number one cause of compressive optic neuropathy, not a tumor, but actually Graves disease. Uh, these are people who will, will present with slowly progressive, painless vision loss. Proptosis and motility restriction, generally not a feature so much. Now, visual fields consistent with papilledema in early stages gla or, or, or glaucoma type fields. You can get an increased concentric cupping uh, in from compressive lesions. Now, compressive lesions can cause a concentric increase in the CD ratio, but it also causes disc pallor, atrophy. Glaucoma notches the neuroretinal rim. Tumors do not notch the neuroretinal rim. Nothing notches the, the neuroretinal rim like glaucoma. Now, of course, we're going to get or orbital imaging. Now, a lot of people worry about, are they missing a tumor? And I think one of the best manuscripts in, in all of eye care is the cupped disc. Who needs neuroimaging? This was a, a joint effort from the glaucoma department and the neuro-ophthalmology department at Baskin Palmas back in 1998. This, to me, is like the Hey Jude or Let It Be uh, of manuscripts. It just stands the test of time. And they compared a group of patients with unusual normal tension glaucoma who got neuroimage for, you know, as part of their evaluation and compared them to patients in the neuro-op department who had compressive lesions in the anterior visual pathway. And this is really simple. It really simplifies it. If you're ever wondering, you know, is this glaucoma or is this a compressive tumor? 
What they found were patients with glaucoma were older, they had better or normal visual acuity, greater loss of the vertical neuroretinal rim, notching, more frequent disc hemorrhages. In fact, disc hemorrhage was 100% specific for glaucoma. Not one tumor patient had a disc hemorrhage. Less neuroretinal rim pallor and field defects that went along the horizontal. People with tumors had reduced or unexplained vision, less than 2040, vertically aligned field defects, optic disc pallor in excess of cupping or optic atrophy, and they were younger, under the age of 50. So more indicative of a compressive mass lesion than glaucoma, younger people who have unexplained vision loss, vertically aligned field defects, and neuroretinal rim pallor. That's as simple as it gets. And I would say in my entire career, this is, it has pretty much borne out. So I don't, I don't image people that I think have glaucoma. I image people I think have something other than glaucoma or in addition to glaucoma. So that's a lot. I'm going to break it down for you and give you a chance to breathe with my ode to a cup disc. Ode to have a cup disc pink that my friend hath a glaucoma to stink. But to have a cup disc pale, call this glaucoma, you shall fail. Disc and field damage is one side that simply cannot be abided. It might be trauma, infarct, or meningioma, but if the rim is cut, always remember, nothing notches a nerve like glaucoma. If you can remember that, that's all we need. All right, we're going to move on to a 42-year-old female, sudden painless loss of vision for one week, getting worse, not getting better, began as a dimming, then rapidly dropped off. 2020 OD 2400 OS with a mild afferent pupillary defect. Confrontation fields are full. She has a central scotoma in the left eye. Everything is normal except for her fundus and looks like this. A massively swollen optic nerve, a macular star of exudates. I will tell you the fellow eye looked perfectly normal. Now, she had a severe flu with malaise, fever, and lymphadenopathy about four weeks earlier. This was pre-COVID, so it's not COVID. No recent tick bites, rashes, or sexual activity, but we have to consider Lyme and syphilis. Both are, are spirochetal bacteria. One's Treponema pallid, one's Borrelia burgdorferi, and they are so similar they can cross-react. A syphilitic patient can test positive for Lyme, and a Lyme patient can test positive for syphilis. Now, she does have an exposure to cat serology, uh, syphilitic testing, HIV testing, Lyme titer, toxoplasmosis, uh, number, but we're all negative, but Bartonella Hensley come back positive, and she has cat scratch neuroretinitis. Or more, or, or more broadly, she has an infectious neuropathy. Now, neuroretinitis, and this is, only, this is the place where the APD severity comes into play. It's a relatively mild APD compared to the vision loss. Vision loss can be dramatic. APD can be very mild. Tell you, it's more retinitis than it is actually neuro. Now, in the macular star is actually a late finding. It, it, it comes pretty late. In these cases, we have massively edematous optic nerves, but there's no macular star. What you do see here, and this is where the OCT is incredibly helpful, will be a serous macular detachment. Not, not edema, not CME, not D, but a serous detachment from the disc all the way to the macula. If you can see a swollen nerve and this type of appearance in OCT, you're dealing with a neuroretinitis, which is an infectious neuropathy. Now, neuroretinitis is often caused by cat scratch disease, can cause, be caused by other things as well. But infectious neuropathies, toxoplasmosis, coriasis, measles, syphilis, Lyme disease, uh, simplex and zoster, mumps, tuberculosis, malignant hypertension, ischemic neuropathies, uh, Bartonella. Please are the vector. Not so you don't have to actually have a scratch. It's a flea bite. Now, if they have infectious neuropathy from neuroretina or neuroretinitis from cat scratch disease, Bartonella hensley or Bartonella quintana. 
the prognosis is excellent for recovery. Most people are going to return to normal and near normal without any, with, without any sort of treatment. Now, you can use antimicrobial therapy. Typically, people have prescribed doxycycline, 100 milligrams by mouth uh, twice a day for a month. Reality is, any antibiotic you like will work just as well. If it is, if it is neuroretinitis from cat scratch disease, Bartonella hensley or Quintana. Now, if it's something else, toxoplasmosis, uh, syphilis, Lyme disease, um, Epstein, now you have to treat it. Right? You have to treat the underlying etiology. So infectious optic neuropathy, a broad term that does include neuroretinitis, which is fairly common. So while antibiotics are frequently used for cat scratch neuroretinitis, there's no clinical trial that shows a better outcome. Same thing for oral steroids intravitreal anti-anogenic medications, there really is, you can, you can use whatever you want to use, it's going to get better. Now, there's a lot of stuff there. I'm going to try to boil it down to what I call an ode to an effective nerve. When the vision is poor and the APD mild, it's often the bite of something wild. If the disc is swollen and the is swelling, great. It's neuroretinitis and the star comes late. Syphilis and Lyme are much alike, can cause similar titers to spike. One is sexually transmitted and the other not, unless the patient's weirder than you thought. Greg, has anything come in yet? No. Um, the ERG question was the last question that rolled in. All right. Now I'm going to We got one here rolling in here. All right. Uh, can't see or hear anything anymore. Oh, it's not really a question. I'm the only one. Nope. Uh, we've got a lot of attendees here. So sorry, Joe. Mm -hmm. Thought that was a question. No worries. Now we're gonna, we're gonna start uh, wrapping up with with our with our encore here. And this is a fairly big topic. And I'm gonna I'm gonna try to break it down and and not be too brutal. Forty eight year old female has sudden vision loss in her right eye for about two days. Uh, she went to a PCP uh, who ordered uh, a, a, a C, or a, she, I think she went to the ER where they did a non contrast uh, enhanced CT of the head, which is quote unquote normal. And Greg, why, why did they do that? Because that's just what they do. It's what they do. Anytime you go to the ER and you've got a, a visual disturbance or a double vision or anything aside from conjunctivitis or corneal abrasion, you're going to get non-contrast enhanced CT of the head because it's what they do. So her PCP is diagnosed her with zoster and prescribed Valtrex and prednisone. Neither had been used or obtained yet because she doesn't think she has zoster, but the PCP referred her to rule out the herpes zoster ophthalmogus. Greg, you see that happen all the time, right? We'd see it all the time, yes. Yeah, they they want to they want us to give them the blessing. Okay, now I'm glad she referred the patient over. Patients 2060 and 2020. There is a marked relative afferent pupillary defect in the right eye. She can get twenty. She can get all the color plates in the right eye and left eye, but right eye is a struggle, and her complaint is retroorbital and temporal pain, which is why she was diagnosed uh, with zoster, which is a little bit unusual here. She didn't think she had zoster, and, and I agree. Now we take a look. Her optic nerves uh, look perfectly normal in each eye. Uh, left eye has got a normal visual field, but we have an inferior arc defect and some general depression. So an afferent defect, 2060 vision, and a visual field defect is not going to be typically found in a patient with zoster. So that brings me up to polling question number four, Greg. Okay, the question is open, and, <clears throat> and it is, what testing should be done? MRV, MRA, MRI, brain with and without contrast, MRI orbits and chiasm, 
with and without contrast. Mm -hmm. After seeing this visual field, these optic nerves, Jay might want to go back and <laughs> put those on so they can look at them. Uh, MRV, MRA, MRI brain with and without contrast, MRI orbits, and chiasm with and without contrast. So there are a couple things to really point out here. 2060 acuity after a defect. Dyschromatopsia, though it's not uh, terrible, and retroorbital and temporal pain. She's 48 years old, and her optic nerves and field look like that. Okay, we've got most, looks like everyone weighed in. I'm going to display it before closing it. No one going for MRB, 5% going for MRA. The majority are going for MRI orbits in chiasm with and without contrast, followed by MRI, MRI of brain with and without contrast. And that's what we really need to do because we have to suspect that, well, actually, polling question number five, this, this one caught me off guard. In fact, we can probably skip the polling question if you've not, if you've not, uh, you've not opened up, have you, Greg? It's we open, can just skip but, that one. But, you know, I can let it run. Okay. What is the most likely diagnosis? Okay, that's good. Optic nerve we'll infection, about 30 infiltrative seconds. orbitopathy, compressive optic neuropathy, demyelinating. I don't know. Zoster seems pretty good to me. I'm going to guess this is the Grand Canyon. Indeed it is. All right, I can, yeah, we have a pretty good amount rolling in. I think the trend is being set here. I'll display it and let the, let it open. So we have 3% going with an optic nerve infection. We've got 10% going infiltrative, climbing, the compressive, 30, and about 60% are saying demyelinating. No one went with zoster. Well, we know that there's a there, there's something happening to the optic nerve. The optic nerve looks normal. So we, we can shut down a lot of things, but, you know, as, as Willie Sutton would say, you know, he, he robbed banks because that's where the money is. So we've really got to look at the uh, at the imaging here. And it came back um, pretty uh, pretty consistent with uh, suspicious optic neuritis, optic nerve thickening, edema, both optic nerves. Um, most of these are are perpendicular lateral ventricles, raising the possibility of demyelinating demyelinization with optic neuritis, and that's what we're dealing with here. She has optic neuritis with demyelinating, probably demyelinating disease, or demyelinating optic neuritis. This is a focal inflammatory demyelinating event of the optic nerve. Can be idiopathic, which is known as a clinically isolated syndrome. If it involves only the optic nerve, there's no, nothing else found. Or it can be associated with other diseases such as multiple sclerosis. Now, 90% of demyelinating neuropathies will be caused by MS. The other 10% is neuromyelitis optica spectrum disorder, NMOSD, and myelin oligodendrocyte glycoprotein antibody disease, or MOGAD. So about 10% of these optic neuritises, demyelinating diseases, are these other rare conditions. A third will show with a papillitis, but two thirds will be retro bulbar, and the optic nerve looks normal. They usually have an abrupt, though progressive vision loss, averaging about 2060, but it can range anywhere from 2020 to no light perception. They also have an afferent defect, dyschromatopsia, decrease in brightness and contrast sensitivity. Usually it's about a two week type of progression with some gradual recovery, though there may be some identifiable deficits, such as 
a residual RAPD or contrast sensitivity decrease. Typically for MS, it is Caucasian, very rare in Asian or people of color, and 92% have pain. I'm going to challenge this because 92% were in the optic neuritis treatment trial had pain, but the other 8% I think were misdiagnosed. Now, the optic neuritis treatment trial, this was 15 centers, randomized 457 acute optic neuritis patients. And came out. this was done several years, this was done years ago before we knew about NMO and MOGAD. And they were they were randomized to oral prednisone. IV methylprednisolone followed by oral prednisone or an oral placebo. Now, at six months, everybody recovered pretty well. The people who got IV steroids recovered faster. After a month, the difference was insignificant in terms of their visual acuity. Now, what we did learn is the oral pred group were two times more likely to develop a recurrent optic neuritis or progress on to, to clinically definite MS. And probably it wasn't the route of administration, but it was insufficient dosing, relatively low. Visual function after treated or untreated optic neuritis usually recovers within about two weeks. Most are going to recover by the end of a month, and they can still recover slowly if there's any residual deficits up to about a year. If there's no visual recovery in the first three weeks, we have to consider this as atypical, and this is not MS-related optic neuritis. So MRI is critical in the diagnosis and management. The ONTT, 15 year results. Conversion to clinically definite MS, all right, 50% overall. Now, if their MRI was normal at baseline, at 15 years, only 25% developed clinically definite MS. If their MRI were, were abnormal, they had demyelinating lesions, 75% progressed to 15 years. Now, the lowest risk of conversion to clinically definite MS were, in this study, males, they had a swollen nerve, they had no pain, and were no light perception. To me, this all falls in the category of these are probably misdiagnosed. They are put into the study, but they didn't really truly have this disease. They had something else. So these were, these were the outliers. The reason they didn't con con uh, to convert to MS is because they probably didn't have the disease to begin with. Now, normal MRI at baseline and no clinically definite MS at 10 years, all right, then there's only a 2% risk of 15 years. I'll talk about dissemination in time and space in just a minute. But I remember when, when I was training, we had, a, we had a don't ask, don't tell type of approach. Okay. Do we don't ask, don't tell, or do we rush to the diagnosis? You know, back when I was training, I'm sure Greg, when you were training, you know, there there was really no treatment for F, for MS at that point, so we weren't inclined to try to make the diagnosis of optic neuri an optic neuritis. Well, now there are interferon therapies that can actually slow the accumulation of disability. So there is a penalty for not starting immunomodulatory therapy right at onset. So we've gone from don't ask, don't tell to make the diagnosis as quickly as we can and get them in the hands of a skilled neurologist who, who, who is experienced at treating MS. Now, demodeling events disseminate in time or space is how this is diagnosed. Disseminate in time, two or more events occurring at different times. Like maybe the brain MRI has signs of fresh lesions and signs of old lesions, though MS is diagnosed. Disseminating in space, two or more events at different neurological areas, maybe at the same time. That's how MS was clinically diagnosed. Now, clinically isolated syndrome, CIS, you have the first episode of inflammation and demyelinization in the central nervous system, but brain MRI is often normal. This does not necessarily indicate MS conversion. People with MS have experienced more than one episode, but 63% of these clinically isolated syndromes, they have a quote-unquote optic neuritis and a normal brain scan, will go on to clinically definite MS. Now, diagnosing MS 
promptly is actually fairly challenging. That's why I don't even try to make the diagnosis. I can uh, you know, I, I can tell what I see, but I don't diagnose MS. I can say this is demyelinating. It's associated with MS. I'm not saying you have MS. But we got the McDonald criteria, and they've actually added CSF uh, assessment that if there are these oligoclonal bands, these are CSF proteins that indicate CNS, CNS inflammation. When we put that into the definition, MS can be diagnosed much earlier. See, before we had that clinically isolated syndrome, we weren't really sure, was so much larger, and MS was a lot smaller. Now, if we can do a CSF analysis along with other brain imaging findings and other neurologic events, that diagnosis of CSS, CIS, clinically isolated syndrome goes down, and the MS diagnosis goes up and they can get into therapy a lot quicker. Now, here's the interesting thing that many people don't realize, optic neuritis doesn't count. You know, the criteria for diagnosing MS does not allow optic nerve to be considered as an anatomic region. So disseminate in space can be demonstrated by lesions in two or two or more of four areas, paraventricular, cortical, juxtacortical, infratentorial, and spinal cord. Optic nerve doesn't count. Now, neurologists have come across clinical cases where the only thing that they could not use were, that prevented them from diagnosing MS was optic nerve. So they end up with clinically isolated syndrome. Then that can delay medication access. Now, if we're to add optic nerve as an anatomical site, optic neuritis, to meet dissemination in time or space, you know, that increases the diagnosis of MS and gets them into, into therapy quicker. So another, story, another, another study just came out looking at this, and if we could add optic nerve involvement, either confirmed by MRI, like our, my patient had, OCT, all right, depression, OCT, or VEP, that will actually increase the diagnosis uh, of multiple sclerosis. So most likely when the McDonald criteria gets updated, uh, optic nerve will probably be added in. And that could be optic neuritis that is confirmed by demyelination on the MRI or an OCT. So a clinical suspicion optic neuritis combined with, with an MRI optic nerve enhancement or an OCT abnormality could actually count in the diagnosis of clinically definite multiple sclerosis. Up until now, it was not allowed. Optic nerve was not allowed. Now, I'm going to talk very briefly, and we're going to wrap this up, about NMO and MOGAD. NMO is a demyelinating disease. It's a small percentage of the demyelinating optic neuropathies. It involves the optic nerve and the spinal cord. And they have antibodies called aquaporin 4 IgG antibodies. This is about 3% of optic neuritis cases. There's only about 22,000 in the, in the U.S. Median age is about 30 now, which is a little bit later than MS. Strong female preference, but an increased prevalence in Asian and African Americans. So if you're thinking MS, you're dealing with a Caucasian patient. If you're dealing with a person of color or Asian, you might be looking at NM NMOSD. And this is a relapsing course. Now, they can be serial negative, but imaging is very helpful. It is a worse disease. Visual acuity is usually going to be worse than 2200. In fact, a third will have a final acuity of less than 2200, where MS, optic neuritis, you know, they're, they're better than 2040. Simultaneous bilateral in 20% of cases, and that only happens about 1% of the time in MS. Uh, central scotoma is very common. Bitemporal from chiasmal involvement uh, is common. And the MRI is going to show bilateral optic nerve enhancement very long lesions, and often chiasmal involved. It is a very bad disease. 
I'm not going to get into treatment. That is, we're, we are kind of running out of time here. But I do want to talk a little bit about MOGAD. Myelin oligodendrocyte glycoproteins. This is the other 10% of the demyelinating neuropathies. This is, this, the, this mod is found on the myelin sheath. Uh, age of onset is the 30s. So these antibodies will damage the myelin sheets in this way. This is about 5% of the adult optic neuritis cases. It is a significant cause of optic neuritis in children, though. MRI longitudinal extensive enhancement of more than 50% of the optic nerve. And about 15% may actually involve the chiasm. So there's the MOG uh, antibodies that we have to look for. So diagnosing MOG is a demyelinating event, including optic neuritis, presence of MOG uh, antibodies, and there's no better uh, explanation. So that's how we diagnose it. You know, interesting, MOG and NMOSD are, are in the forefront of thought in neuro-ophthalmology. But they are, they are actually pretty uncommon diseases. Now, hey Joe, I want to make a comment to, say, to the audience yeah. that the survey is open. Um, mm -hmm. The survey is open. It's the fourth one down on the right. But go ahead, Joe. You know, I use I used to quip that whenever somebody sees something they don't recognize in the retina and they can't identify it, it automatically defaults to some sort of white dot syndrome. It appears as though right now, when in neuro-ophthalmology, if we can't identify something, it somehow defaults to NMO and MOGAD. And these are really demyelinating diseases that afflict the optic nerve. I had one 50-year-old patient uh, who had been evaluated and was told that you know, we, we really needed to look for NMO and MOGAD, and he did not have any sort of neuropathy. It was just they were lost for anything else. And one of my former students, age 39, was told that she might have a MOGAD or NMO. And she actually had a cataract. But, you know, these are things that a, any reasonable person is going to look up and they're going to see the poor prognoses. And, you know, I don't, I don't like to default to these. These are very specific type of diseases. So, Greg, I could go on and on. Uh, I think probably now is a good place to stop if you agree. Yeah, I think it's uh, fantastic. You did a great job here tonight. Uh, let me check the chat box. No other <laughs> questions are in here. Um, yeah, as you can tell, Joe, this is your expertise. I've heard you lecture in this before. It never gets tiring. Um, you definitely have a command on this uh, information. But what we think all of us love out here, and I'll speak from it, just about everyone, is how you can make it easy and help us uh, in everyday practice to remember this so that when we do have these cases that come in, we know which ones are the emergencies and which ones are we can um, you know, kind of step back and have a little time to to think about. So we appreciate that. Thank you, Greg. We I got through all my topics. I had a couple interesting cases, but we want to be respectable uh, of everybody's time on a Sunday night. So I'm going to stop the sharing, and we're going to land. We're going to land this baby. Okay. And there we are. So I just want to. Uh, questions are answered. Thank everyone. Thank you, Joe. Thank everyone for attending. This was Clinical Grand Rounds in Optic Neuropathies. You've got some nerves. And Joe, thank you again for doing it. Oh, you're welcome. Always, always, always enjoy doing it. Always enjoy working with you. Always enjoy uh, educating our colleagues.